With the Halo TV series now just a little under a week away from its premiere, and with early reviews and reactions hitting the net, I think it's a good time to dive into the various characters, locations, and other details that will be appearing on screen starting March 24th. While I won't be discussing spoilers from the series, naturally I will be talking about how certain characters in the TV show compare to their game or novel counterparts. Keep in mind too that the Halo TV series is set in its own timeline, the Silver Timeline, so any information from the core canon might not align with the direction of the TV show. With that, let's begin. The Halo TV series will feature a mix of characters, some pulled from existing Halo stories, others created for the show. Headlining the series is, of course, the iconic Master Chief, John 117, who will be portrayed by Pablo Schreiber. Naturally, this Master Chief will be more of a character in this series than he was in the classic trilogy. And as I'm sure many have heard by now, Schreiber will go helmetless in the show at times, something I'm personally excited about. When the Chief is alone, I can understand him keeping his helmet on most of the time. In the novels, it's noted how Spartan 2s generally feel more at home in their armor, feeling almost naked without it. However, the Chief will not be alone in this show. Accompanying Master Chief will be a set of new Spartan 2s, Vanek-134, portrayed by Bentley Kalu, Kai-125, portrayed by Kate Kennedy, and Riz-028, portrayed by Natasha Kolzak. Together, these Spartans form Silver Team. According to a Silver Debrief, a series of articles on Halo Waypoint diving into certain details about the show, these new Spartans were pulled directly from 343's internal notes on the Spartan 2 program, which is to say that they could appear in core canon in the future. That aside, we know very little about these new Spartan 2s at the moment, Though Vanek-134 is described as the, quote, de facto deputy of the Master Chief, Kai-125 has been described as courageous, curious, and deadly, and Riz-028 being focused, professional, and deadly. I'll be looking forward to just how deadly these Spartans are. In the core canon, Spartan 2s were created to fight human insurrection, not alien invaders. Kidnapped as children and raised into obedient warriors, the Spartan 2s were further enhanced with a series of experimental and dangerous augmentations, and eventually equipped with that iconic Mjolnir armor. Trailers for the TV series have shown that much of this backstory will seemingly remain intact, and it seems the show intends to explore the horrors of the Spartan 2 program as part of its narrative. To help tell this story, the TV show will feature Spartan Soren 066, who will be portrayed by the amazing Bokeem Woodbine. In core canon, when the Spartan 2s underwent their augmentation at age 14, only 33 survived the process fully intact. 30 were reportedly killed, though their bodies were immediately put into cryo storage in the hopes they might be resuscitated in the future, and 12 were left severely crippled, among them being Soren 066. Soren's story in the core canon, as told in the short story Pariah from Halo Evolutions, was a tragic one. To sum things up, Soren was born on an outer colony and saw both his mother and father die to a disease. He later met Dr. Halsey, who offered him the choice to join her Spartan 2 program. And later, whether he wanted to undergo the dangerous augmentation processes, something she never offered to any other candidate. While Halsey was likely just attempting to ease her own conscience, it gave Soren a very different relationship with the Spartan 2 program. As noted, however, the augmentations would leave Soren crippled, and he'd be reassigned to a desk job. Eventually, he became disillusioned with the UNSC and attempted to defect to the insurrection, but was shot down over the planet Reach before he could escape. No body was ever found, though he never appeared in the core canon again after that. As for the TV series, a silver debrief does note that Soren's original backstory will be, quote, directly relevant in the show. Like with many aspects of the show, however, things are subject to change. In the shots we've seen of Soren, we can see him wearing Mjolnir armor, something he never had the opportunity or capability of doing in core canon, and isn't really visibly crippled. I'm thinking at the moment that either Soren managed to get some help to reverse some of the side effects of his augmentations, something that has been done in core canon before, or maybe his Mjolnir is essentially a full-body life support system of sorts. Or maybe he's just a rogue Spartan. Whatever the case, Soren will be working out of a location from the books known as The Rubble, which we'll talk about more when we get to locations the show will feature. He also apparently has his own spaceship, according to Woodbine. Next, let's discuss the head of the Spartan 2 program and the creator of the smart AI Cortana, Dr. Catherine Halsey. Portrayed here by Natasha McElhone, Halsey is one of Halo's most interesting and infamous characters. A woman of unparalleled genius and ego, Dr. Halsey can be described as a major reason for the survival of humanity during the Human Covenant War, and a monster. 
When taking on the role of Dr. Halsey, McElhone described how she did a lot of research on AI, reading books and talking with experts, some of whom were Halo fans. It's always exciting to hear about an actor really getting into their roles, which gives me high hopes for McElhone's Dr. Halsey. As noted, Dr. Halsey was the head of the Spartan II program, and while that position was appointed by the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, much of the program's specifics were created by Dr. Halsey herself. It was Dr. Halsey who decided that kids were needed for the program, she decided on the precise criteria for her candidates, and she dictated the augmentations the candidates would go through. In both Halo The Fall of Reach and Dr. Halsey's journal, a bonus from the limited and legendary editions of Halo Reach, we can see Halsey torn apart by her role while simultaneously trying to justify it as necessary. She is both a beloved character and a person easy to hate. Portraying such a complex character will be no easy feat, though McElhone appears to be down for the challenge. The TV series will also feature a new take on Cortana. Modeled after Natasha McElhone herself, the TV show's Cortana takes inspiration more from the weapon from Halo Infinite, at least aesthetically. Originally set to be voiced by McElhone, scheduling conflicts resulted in Jen Taylor, the original Cortana, reprising her role for the TV series. In the core canon, Cortana is a smart AI, aka an AI created using a scan of a human brain, a process that normally destroys the donor brain. In the case of Cortana, however, Halsey cloned herself, copied her memories into the clone brain, then used that to create Cortana, a process both highly unethical and highly illegal. Little has been said about Cortana in the TV show as of yet, but it appears as though her origins will remain largely intact. At some point in the show, she'll begin working with the Master Chief and Silver Team. Next up, we have Captain Jacob Keyes, eventual captain of the Pillar of Autumn. Portrayed in this show by Danny Sapani, we haven't seen much of his character yet in the trailers or promotional material. Like in the core canon, however, he does have a close relationship with Dr. Halsey, and the two have a child, Miranda Keys. In the core canon, Jacob Keys was a man loyal to a fault and able to keep secrets like no other. This resulted in a slow career track for many years, and the reason he would eventually be recruited by Dr. Halsey for aid during her screening of Spartan II candidates. Keyes was present when Halsey met John 117, the future Master Chief, for the first time. Keyes would only be promoted to the rank of Captain following the Battle of Sigma Octanus IV, just a month before the Fall of Reach. And now we come to Miranda Keyes, portrayed in the TV show by Olive Gray. While a naval officer like her core canon counterpart, the TV show has also made Miranda a scientist like her mother. The core canon never featured Miranda much outside of Halo 2 and 3, so she's essentially a blank slate in many ways. What details we do have tell of Catherine Halsey sending Miranda away to live with her father when Miranda was young, Halsey believing Jacob would be a far better parent. This naturally led to a strained relationship between mother and daughter, and the relationship between Catherine, Jacob, and Miranda will be a core part of the TV series. In the most recent trailer, Miranda is shown talking to another character, one who notes that she'd like to avoid relying on Halsey as much as possible going forward. This is Admiral Margaret Perengoski, portrayed here by Shabana Azmi. In core canon, Admiral Perengoski was the head of the Office of Naval Intelligence, and one of the people who gave a go-ahead for the Spartan II program. Oddly, it was somehow kept from her that the Spartan II program would be replacing the children it kidnapped with rapidly grown clones that would generally die after a few weeks. This in part led to a rather tense relationship between Perengoski and Halsey, Halsey regarding the Admiral as one of the few people she genuinely feared. We don't get to see much of Azmi's Perengoski in the trailer, but she seems to have the domineering presence Perengoski is said to have down pat. The show will additionally feature Lord Terrence Hood, who will be portrayed in the show by veteran actor Keir Dullia, probably best known for his role as Dr. David Bowman in 2001, A Space Odyssey. I can certainly say I never expected Hood to appear in the show, but the man looks the part. In the core canon, Terrence Hood was once the executive officer to Captain James Cutter before receiving a ship of his own. During the Battle of Arcadia in 2531, then Captain Hood was ordered to recover a log buoy left by the Spirit of Fire as it chased after a kidnapped Professor Ellen Anders. Instead, Hood engaged with remaining Covenant forces, losing the log buoy in any chance of finding the Spirit. Despite this, Hood would rise to the rank of Fleet Admiral by 2552, overseeing Earth's defense fleet. Hood didn't appear too much outside of Halo 2 and 3, but his brief cameo in Halo Ghosts of Onyx paints him as an ally to Dr. Halsey and a friend to the Spartans, something I hope to see reflected in the TV series. Along with a host of familiar characters, the TV series will introduce a number of new characters to round out the story being told. 
The best known of these new characters is Yeren Oz, Quan Ha. Quan is a young girl from an outer colony, which comes under Covenant attack early in the show. Quan's role largely seems to be to give the insurrection a face and add a human element to the show, especially early on. While we know little of Quan's story at the moment, she is seen many times in the trailers alongside Soren 066. Byrne Gorman, an amazing English actor from Pacific Rim and Torchwood, among other projects, will join the cast as a character named Venture. Fiona O'Shaughnessy will star as a character named Lyra. Interestingly, she also acted in a movie called The Halo Effect, though that has no relation to Halo, just found that interesting. Finally, there's Ryan McParland playing a character named Adun. No details on these characters have been released as of the writing of this video. Now, with most of our known cast covered, let's talk about a new character that has caused quite a stir in the community, Maki. Portrayed by actress Charlie Murphy, Maki is a human who was raised, in some capacity, by the Covenant. For anyone who might not be aware, in the core canon, the reason the Covenant wanted to wipe out humanity was because the leaders of the Covenant, the High Prophets, wanted to cover up the fact that humans were the chosen inheritors of the Forerunner legacy. This essentially made the entire Covenant religion a sham, so the High Prophets declared a holy war against humanity. While Maquis might seem like a major contradiction on paper, franchise development director Frank O'Connor has stated that the reason she is spared by the Covenant is made evident within minutes of her introduction, and that the reasons for that would be something familiar to fans. Most likely, this means that she's spared due to humanity's innate ability to interact with Forerunner tech. But even that aside, keeping even one human around could lead some within the Covenant to questioning their leadership. We'll have to wait until the 24th for a full answer, but I suspect that Maki's existence is largely kept secret, with a dedicated team working alongside her. And I just want to address this quickly, the scene with Maki and Letgolo, the orange worms, is almost certainly not Maki controlling them. They're simply working together like elites and hunters would. Okay? Okay. With that, however, we've covered the known cast, bringing us to locations. Several locations have been shown in the various teasers, trailers, and images, but today we'll cover those that have been confirmed by 343. We'll start with the colony of Madrigal, one of the UNSC's various outer colonies, meaning colonies founded more recently, relatively speaking, and often much further from Earth. In core canon, Madrigal was found in the 23 Libre system, approximately 85 light years from Earth. It came under Covenant attack in 2528 and was glassed soon after, much of the civilian population evacuating the planet and moving to a hideout known as the Rubble, which we'll discuss in a moment. While not confirmed to my knowledge, Madrigal seems to be the home world of Quan Ha, and in core canon, was home to Kojo, Romeo, Agu, among others. In the show, the planet has seemingly survived much longer than its core canon counterpart, and as a result, even major settlements like this one have fallen on hard times, a combination of the collapse of colonial trade and infighting amongst local factions. In addition to Madrigal, the 23 Libre system was home to Hesoid, the system's only gas giant, at least in core canon. When Madrigal fell, many refugees made their way to an asteroid colony near Hesoid, known as the Rubble. In core canon, the Rubble would ultimately fall in 2535, but in the Silver Timeline, the collection of interconnected asteroids has survived much longer. The Rubble will also act as Soren 066's base of operations. In the core canon, the Rubble was able to survive as long as it did, in part thanks to some trade with Jekyll Pirates. I'll be interested to see if that carries over to the TV show in any capacity. It wasn't unheard of for humans not affiliated with the UNSC or Earth government to try and ally with the Covenant, often ignorant of the alien hegemony's true goals. Reach as well will feature prominently in the TV show, though it seems the main location we'll be in is an entirely new one. The city on Reach seen in the trailers is heavily inspired by work from Halo Reach and Halo The Fall of Reach, the animated series, so it looks right at home on the doomed planet. Reach was the UNSC's primary military hub, second only to Earth herself, which is wonderfully demonstrated with the various ships we can see in the skies over the city. In the background, we see what's known as White Tower, a Fleetcom operations center and relay hub. In the core canon, Reach was the first colony the unified Earth government founded, making it the first of the inner colonies, colonies founded during the first wave of extrasolar human expansion. Inner colonies often have closer ties and loyalty to Earth, and are often more well-to-do. I could go into more detail on Reach, but beyond having done that already, link in the description box and info box, I think you know how that story ends. Like with the characters, let's close out the locations with the major covenant location in this show, the Holy City of High Charity. Anyone familiar with the games will note that the Holy City has undergone a notable facelift, 
though it retains its distinguished silhouette. We haven't seen much of the city's interior, though this shot of Maquis does show the Forerunner key ship, the Anodyne Spirit, which once lay at the city's center. I would love if we got to see that up close, or even got to see it inside. And the core cannon, the Anodyne Spirit, later referred to as the Forerunner Dreadnought by the Covenant, was accidentally brought to the Prophet's homeworld by a fragment of a Forerunner AI known as Mendicant Bias. The ship would eventually be the center of high charity and power the Holy City, while the fragment of Mendicant Bias was revered as an oracle. While I doubt it, I would love if we got to see early hints at that. Despite often working from the background, Mendicant Bias is actually a pretty important part of the Halo games. When the Prophet of Truth made it to the Ark with the Anodyne Spirit, the fragment of Mendicant Bias was able to reunite with its full self, and it would go on to aid the Master Chief from behind the scenes. It was even Mendicant Bias who sent the Chief to Requiem, kicking off Halo 4 in the events to follow. Though the AI had no idea a Mad Didact awaited at Requiem, just to be clear. As we begin to close out this video, I'd like to briefly touch on the ships and vehicles we've seen in the trailers so far. Starting with the UNSC, we've seen Halberd-class destroyers, seen here floating over Reach. Here we can see a currently unknown class of frigate, also over Reach, and I would wager this is probably a Paris-class frigate, the type introduced in Halo Reach. Here we have a Gladius-class heavy corvette, a ship previously only visualized for Halo Warfleet. New to Halo, we here have the Zhang He-class courier. This one is the Endymion II, Dr. Halsey's personal craft. Endymion, by the way, was Halsey's homeworld. Moving over to the vehicles, the iconic D-77 Pelican will be present, along with what the production calls the Super Condor, aka the Pelican-looking vehicle with the 325 on it. Condors and Core Cannon are basically upgraded Pelicans, often featuring slipspace travel capabilities, something rarely found in anything other than ships. Mongoose ATVs and M808 Scorpion tanks can also be spotted, and of course, the iconic Warthog. And seeing Spartans outrun that Warthog is just gold. On the Covenant side of things, we first have a Ket Pattern CCS-class battlecruiser. The Pattern designation is essentially a subclass of the ship. Ket Pattern ships have four fins, or sensor vanes, under the front of their ship, while Elephant Pattern ships have two. Most of the CCS-class cruisers in the games are Ket Pattern, though you can see what an Elephant Pattern CCS cruiser would look like with the original version of the Truth and Reconciliation from Halo CE. Next, we have an SDV Heavy Corvette, a design introduced in Halo Reach. Compared to human Corvettes, the SDV is massive. For anyone wondering about the three-letter classification for Covenant ships, these codes are transliterations of primary, secondary, and tertiary classification codes used by the Covenant. Basically, in canon, the class would tell a knowledgeable trooper or officer what sort of capabilities the ship might have. While these classifications haven't been fleshed out much in the core canon, there's a definite opportunity to do so in the TV show. Moving over to vehicles, we've seen Phantom dropships in the trailers. While they heavily resemble their in-game counterparts, there are some notable visual distinctions. Most likely, these are Type 52 Phantoms, the type designating the year they were first encountered or cataloged. So, the T-52 Phantom was first encountered or first cataloged in 2552. Speaking of dropships, the recent trailer also showed off a Type 25 Spirit, something I never expected to see. Below said Spirit are what appear to be Covenant drop pods. While hard to make out any details, they look a lot like the single occupant pods used, once again, in Halo Reach. Finally, the last confirmed vehicle so far is the Type 26B Banshee, aka the Banshee first introduced, say it with me again, in Halo Reach. A recent behind-the-scenes video commented on how much Halo Reach assets were used for weapon designs, so perhaps the same was true for ships and vehicles. With that, though, I think we'll wrap up this video. Hopefully you all found this useful as we prepare for the premiere of the Halo TV series, at least in certain territories. If there's interest, I could do a pre-premiere Q&A video answering questions you all might have before the premiere. If there is interest, share it in the comments below. Otherwise, until next time, this has been Halo Canon. Thank you once again for watching Canonites. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, maybe even share it around, both of which help the channel. And if you aren't subscribed already, consider becoming a fellow Canonite and hitting that notification bell so you won't miss any future videos. Halo Canon now has a Discord server, which you can find linked in the description box below. If you like discussing any aspect of Halo's lore, well, that's what we specialize in. Thank you all once more, and keep on being awesome.